presenting alongside SEMA, Dr Lucy Cook, pharmaceutical physician at Wiltshire Pharma. Lucy qualified from Dundee University Medical School in 1999 and she initially embarked on a career in general practice. She entered the pharmaceutical industry in 2003, working in the sales and marketing role. And since then, she's held various posts within medical affairs, including Deputy EA QPPV, supporting medical information, regulatory affairs, PV, commercial and business development. Lucy founded Wiltshire Pharma Limited in January 2017 to offer contract pharmaceutical physician support to various organisations. She's currently an educational supervisor for pharmaceutical medicine speciality training and is undertaking further training to become a revalidation appraiser. Lucy, over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle, and welcome everybody this morning. Thank you for joining us. So I will be taking you through some of the key considerations for any advisory board that you might be involved with or advising on. So this is what I'll take you through, the ABPI code considerations that you should uh, cover, the requirements of the actual meeting itself, the planning that you'll need to undertake, and then we'll turn to numbers. There are lots of numbers to consider in planning an advisory board. There are various materials that you'll need to plan and produce. And we also need to have a careful think about unlicensed products and indications of already authorised products. I'll look briefly at a past case and then I'll turn to the key points at the end. So the ABPI code does cover the requirements of advisory boards in their advice which they published last year. However, we are looking closely at clauses 22, 23 and 24. So this covers the requirements of meetings and hospitality as well as any honoraria or payments that will be made as well as the transfers of value considering also the use of consultants. I would advise you to remind yourself when planning an advisory board to go through the PMCPA advice. They have a list of questions which can be used as a checklist to make sure you're on the right lines. So what are the overarching requirements? They are driven by the need to gain expert opinion and advice and at all times that needs to be the main reason for the advisory board existing in the first place and it is important to take time to consider the bigger picture and how all the arrangements could be perceived when viewed externally. So you're trying to gain understanding and answer legitimate business questions to which you don't already know the answer to and consider that the advisory board is a way of obtaining information but you need to reassure yourself that it is the most appropriate way of obtaining the information that you don't yet have. You must ensure that the advisory board meeting is not held because of a desire by either healthcare professionals or members of the marketing authorisation holders to share information. And to that end, all the activities and all the materials must not be promotional in nature. Ideally, no sales force involvement. But if you do proceed very carefully and be clear on their advisory role in the advisory board meeting. I would suggest that ideally all the meeting arrangements should be driven by the medical department and their advice be followed. Be sure when you're planning the advisory board meeting that the majority of the meeting time is given over to participants voicing their expert opinions. So short presentations to help set the scene and start the discussions and invite opinion are absolutely valid, but lengthy presentations would be perceived as promotion, which is absolutely not allowed at advisory board meetings. Make sure you have all participants agreeing to the ABPI code and your company's requirements 
and sign a consultancy agreement in advance of the meeting. Ensure that all the materials that you're producing reflect the above requirements. Again, ensuring that it is non-promotional in look and feel and intention. So when planning the meeting, you will need time to identify who might be the appropriate individuals to answer the questions that you don't know those answers to. Ensure that they can give meaningful input to the meeting. Consider that limited numbers will ensure that you'll have meaningful participation by all attendees. A larger number starts to not only look and feel promotional, but also will limit the amount of airtime each participant can be given. So choose those participants carefully. Pre-reading can be very helpful and this could be planned well in advance to ensure that all the participants are familiar and up to speed with pertinent information so that when you start your advisory board meeting you can get going promptly on the matters at hand and not have to bring everyone up to speed. You'll probably already have a big picture of what you want to achieve, but maybe drill down to some precise questions that need answering, opinions that you need to gain, and think about what the output might look like so that you've got an end goal. Again, just check that you are conducting advisory board meetings for the right reasons and ensure that it is the best way of obtaining that information. It might be that some market research would obtain the information more quickly, easy, more easily and possibly at a cheaper, cheaper rate. So I said I'd talk about numbers. You need to have a clear and sound justification for the participants. So do limit their numbers. Also consider that there may have been similar meetings or repeat meetings within the last 12 months or so. Be careful with this because this also could be perceived as promotional. Consider the honoraria that you might be needing to pay the participants and ensure that they are fair market rates. They must be commensurate with the time and effort involved, as well as the professional status of the participants. Plan your hospitality budget and what you would like to offer the participants, ensuring that this does not exceed any limits you have within your organisation or obviously within the ABPI code. Ensure that the numbers of people that you had from your own organisation as well as any agency attendees and be clear on what their roles are, their job titles and what they will actually be doing at the advisory board meeting. Again, it can be very difficult to justify sales people being at that meeting. So what are the materials needed? Uh, you'll need all these meeting arrangements that I've spoken about, um, as well as the materials that you want to be using at the meeting, and be careful on those. They must not be promotional, with the exception of if you are trying to understand how a particular promotional idea or piece is received, it might be possible to reasonably expose the participants to that promotional material. You'll obviously need from the outset an invitation and that must clearly state the purpose of the meeting, their expected advisory role within the meeting and the amount of work that might be under needed to be undertaken, including any pre-reading. It's a very good idea to create a briefing for everyone that might be involved, whether it's you as staff, any third parties and the participants that you're inviting. So they're near clear on that need and the expected output from the meeting itself. The consultancy agreements will need to be drawn up. 
obviously in compliance with the ABPI code, but ensure that any of your legal people uh, who need to be contacted are contacted and ensure that you have the most up-to-date version of that agreement. I've mentioned pre-reading and any preparatory work that you might need to undertake already, but bear in mind you may want to do some slide presentations um, that will need working up carefully and condensing as much as possible, along with, of course, an agenda. It is strongly advised as well that you, un you plan to take minutes at the meeting, so that you have a formal record of everything that happened and everything that was said at that meeting. Be careful if the product you are discussing at the advisory board meeting is unlicensed or if you have a licensed product that you are discussing unlicensed indications. Be particularly careful in mentioning any of this on the invitation as this will probably be shared more widely than you would wish if there is a query on it. So this must not be promotional, so go careful on the language that's used in any invitation as well as throughout the planning of the advisory board meeting. And ensure there's a careful balance of information receiving versus information giving in this area. Only impart as much information in pre-reading and on the day of the meeting itself as is actually necessary to gain the answers you need. If you're imparting more information, again, it will start to look and feel as if it is promotional. I said we'd have a quick look at a past case. This is uh, from a couple of years ago now where a consultant renal physician complained about the conduct of an Abbott advisory board meeting. He was in receipt of an unsigned invitation to an advisory board meeting and he didn't consider himself expert in the topic at hand. When the panel looked into the case, they felt on balance there was excessive time spent on presentations and not enough time for feedback and advice from participants. And to that end, it appeared to be a promotional meeting. The company intended to have a total of 15 attendees, but with only a few weeks to run before the meeting, only two participants had confirmed their attendance. So many more local invitations were drawn up and handed out by the sales team. This was deemed to not have been maintaining high standards at all, and therefore a breach of clause not was uh, deemed appropriate. So I will hand over to Seema because she will make a special mention of the pharmacovigilance requirements in this setting. Hi everyone, um, thanks Lucy. I think uh, if we're looking at ad wards and drug safety uh, requirements around that, it really does for making sure that any adverse events that are brought to your attention are reported appropriately within the company so that you take all the details of any adverse events and that is um, sent through your company process so they can be reported, put onto the safety database and then expedited if needed to the health authority. I think the thing to remember of a special situation, and so it's not just an adverse event, but of course things like use in pregnancy, medication errors, abuse, overdose, etc. as well. Apart from that, it's, it's not like the market research side where there are specific requirements. Here it is just to, to be aware and to make sure that you do report everything as it comes through. I'll hand back to Lucy now. Thank you, Seema. So, in summary, uh, the key points are plan carefully and early. Medical should be driving this process, if at all possible. Ensure that all the materials are well prepared in advance. 
with pre-reading being strongly encouraged as it allows the attendees to be informed and ready to advise on the day of the meeting. Extra caution is required where there's a pre-license or off-label indication that is being ignored or discussed at the meeting. And watch the numbers. This is detail that's really probably going to fall foul of the code if any part is going to. So the numbers of participants should be limited, any repeat meetings should be limited and sound justification for any repeat meetings, certainly within 12 months or so. Ensure that the payments are appropriate, the hospitality is within reasonable limits, as well as the timings of the discussions and your company attendees. Remember to declare any transfers of value and if possible use the PMCPA advice as a checklist. I would also say that just make you stand back from some of the detail and look at the big picture. How does it look and feel from the outset to somebody looking in on the situation because that's really how it will be perceived if it were to ever get to the panel at the PMCPA. So that's really what I wanted to say. I'd be happy to take any questions, if anybody has any. Um, let me know. Okay, so Seema's asked, when is it okay for a sales rep to attend? I would suggest that you could permit a sales rep to attend so long as a clear briefing was written and approved ahead of the meeting where they have a clear to play which is sales. So you'll be used to marketing people uh, advising and being involved in the meeting itself. Similarly, the sales person could be involved so long as they had a clear role to play at the meeting that wouldn't ordinarily be conducted by somebody else. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Happy to take any other questions? I can't see any others coming through, so um, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to email at my email address or give me a call. Um, my details are on the screen now. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Have a good day.